Welcome to the Living Ageless and Bold podcast. Each episode, I bring you amazing women who inspire, educate, and share their experiences and journeys along the way. So grab a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's relax and have some fun hearing what can be accomplished after 55. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Living Ageless and Bold. I have a celebrity in the house. I always like when we do that. It's so fun. Alisa Gambino is an Emmy award-winning producer from her time on CNN and in the past five years has done some incredibly thought-provoking documentaries, docu-series. Um, she has an Oscar nomination for one of those that uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, so she is the epitome of Living Ageless and Bold doing this later in life, these docu-series. And I can't wait to hear your journeys. Welcome, Elisa. Thank, thanks for having me, Christina. I have to do one correction, though. My Uh-oh. film was Oscar qualified, but unfortunately, we didn't get a nomination. But that's okay. okay. I like the sound of nominations. I like, well, and I just put it out there in the universe for you. So your next one <laughs> will be so. Oscar qualified is pretty darn impressive, too. Yes. So let's, let, we won't diminish happy. that. Okay, I'm sure. So I always like to talk about, you know, we don't wake up our age as a successful woman who's created, you know, the docu-series and documentaries that we're going to talk about. There's a path to get you here. And that path includes, you know, the good, bad and the ugly. Uh, So how did you get to CNN? What was that? Did you major in journalism? You know, how did you end up doing that? No. So when I was 16, um, my family moved to Rome because my father was assigned there to the embassy. And so I went to my final year of high school there. And then I came back to the States for college and I went to uh, Virginia Tech. And But I would go back to Rome every summer and Christmas. And then I graduated and I really wanted to live in Italy. And so I just kind of plopped myself down there. And I heard of this, you know, newly... I mean, CNN hadn't been around that long. This was 1987. And um, I the bureau was looking for um, like a, um, a bureau assistant. So that's someone who takes everybody's laundry to the laundry, who, who fills the car, <laughs> fills, fills the bureau vehicle with gas, kind of learns all the ropes to step in as needed. And so I was with a group of journalists there. I got the job and um, I was the only person in the bureau at the time that spoke Italian fluently. And so I had a, I I had a lot of responsibility and that was great. And, um, and they embraced my uh, ignorance and all things journalism and taught me, I got a lot of like battlefield instruction, I guess. And that's how I got my job with CNN because they needed someone who was uh, could speak Italian and English. And then what happened was, um, so I would go out and field produce on feature stories and things like that in the Rome Bureau. But then the Berlin Wall came down and then the revolution in Romania happened and all these things started happening and CNN didn't have enough people. And so they just said, Elisa, go, go. And I had to learn on the job. Sometimes that's the best way to learn it though. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, they say, you know, when an opportunity presents itself, I I wouldn't say all opportunities, but if one like that presents itself, you know, step into it. Right. So that's what I tried to do. Absolutely. And we do have a lot of younger women who listen to get inspired as they hear our journeys along the way. And from a lot of people, a lot of the media people that I've interviewed, I mean, that was really it. It's banging down doors and doing the things you might not want to do to get your foot in the door and have the opportunity. Um, And you said Virginia Tech. I I knew that, but then I didn't know that because I'm a Hokie too. And when I, I had the fortune, very fortunate to interview Hoda Kotb, and she tells the story of literally 37 no's. And the yes she got was because the news gal, I think it was Memphis, uh, was sick. And the producer said, if you can fit in that jacket, I'll put you down. You know, you can sit there. And apparently she said she was terrible, but then the woman was sick another day. So she got another opportunity to wear the woman's you know, blazer and go on. And that's how her career started. And we've heard a lot of that, that you just, just go for it. Just somebody, if opportunity is there. What was your favorite story when you were based out of Rome doing all that stuff in Europe? Um, well, to her point, I was pretty terrible too at first, but thank goodness I had a lot of people who were very patient with me and some not so patient, which meant I had, I was on a very steep learning curve. Um, we, when I was at the Rome Bureau, so 
We covered the fall of the Berlin Wall. We covered the revolution in Romania. I spent quite a bit of time on the Bosnian, on the Serbian side of the war in Bosnia. Um, I was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was elected. So I would say, I, I would say ninety percent of the stories I covered were um, were uh, con related to conflict and related to um, things happening to people that were very much out of their own control. But when we were in South Africa, that was uh, just uh, amazing to see people coming out and vote for the first time ever um, and to just um, be around Mandela. I got to interview him with a few quick questions once. <laughs> And just his aura, yeah, it was amazing. So, and uh, the 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 promise for change, everything. It was just um, a really uh, hopeful and, and great story. That's amazing. I'm my family is from Berlin. I'm first generation American, so I actually have a piece of the wall when it came down. And you know, for a little girl who grew up going there and seeing the wall, and the soldiers were everywhere, and the barbed wire, and and I took my kids there not too long ago, and I was trying to explain to them. Literally, when you looked over the wall, it was gray. You couldn't explain it. It was sunny blue skies on the west, and then it was gray on the east. And when that wall came down, it was just just right. Because all these people had freedoms now that mm -hmm. they didn't have before. Right. So. I'd say those were the two most, the, the happiest stories I ever covered were the Berlin wall. And then the elections in South Africa, those were the two, the rest of them were not so happy. <laughs> which, um, which ones did you win Emmys for or Emmy? I don't know if it's yeah. multiple. So um, for um, our coverage in Somalia. So I was in Somalia when, um, the operation restore hope began. And so the night that the U S soldiers landed on the beach as I was there. And so we won that for our news coverage of that event. Yeah. Wow. So how long were you with CNN? I was with CNN from 1987 to 2001 and in 2000. So I was with them um, for several years in Rome and then Moscow that's um, so I was at the Rome Bureau for two and a half years. I mean, the Moscow Bureau for two and a half years. And then we moved to Atlanta to be my husband and I was seen. And I had never worked here before. I had been working for CNN, but never here at headquarters. And um, so then I lasted about a year and a half here because I would <laughs> it's just awful. I was used to working in the field and I would go to these morning meetings and I would be told, oh, we need to do a story about, I don't know, sharks in Florida, like uh, what little percentage of the pop population does that affect? But anyway, so then I would <laughs> go back to my office and put all these things in motion. Then by the afternoon, the show producer would say, nah, we don't really want that anymore. So I felt very much like my life was not under my control and that I, uh, the news coverage, I was no longer contributing to what we would cover, but I was kind of taking uh, direction from others. And when I'd been living in Rome and Moscow, we very much, uh, had uh, determined the coverage, you know, it was a really different dynamic. So I had to get out. So CNN was giving away packet, you know, um, they were laying people off and I, I didn't get laid off and I was kind of bummed. And so then I went to my boss and I asked if um, I could be laid off and get a package. And uh, he said, well, we're not taking volunteers. And I said, I think you are. If, if, if I think you are, I'm volunteering. And he said, are you going to go work for another news network? I said, no, I'm opening a pasta shop. And, um, and that's what I did. So I got so a package. <laughs> All right. This is going to be a story. So you went from Bosnia, South Africa, the, watching the Berlin wall go down, you lived in Moscow and you traded it all in for pasta. Yes. So okay. I, <laughs> When I moved to Atlanta, I was very disappointed. And not anymore. Now we have great food here. But when I moved here 25 years ago, I was really disappointed in the options that we had here for, especially for fresh pasta. And I, at that point, I was ready to have something that was very much my own, that I could have my own, you know, colleagues that worked with me, that we shared a vision for what we wanted to do with the business. And so, um, so I... <laughs> I went to my boss and I asked to be laid off. And then I went back up to my office and my husband, who was a photographer and editor at CNN, he came into my office. I said, Neil, I just asked to be laid off. Remember, we had talked about that. <laughs> and he said, Elisa, we have we have two tiny kids in private preschool. And we just bought a house. Like, what are you doing? 
I said, well, you'll just keep working here while I get us, you know, get the business off the ground. And he said, no, if you're leaving, I'm leaving too. We do everything together. He, I said, well, what are you going to do? He goes, I'll start my own production company. So I said, okay. So he went and he offered to leave too. And we both got um, packages and he started a production company and I started my pasta business. And so I went back to Italy and I learned how to make fresh pasta from a very, um, a famous family in the pasta making world in Rome. And, um, and I came back here and I had the shop from 2001 to 2008. And we, we were in all the whole foods. I had a pasta truck. I was on food network. I, <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Well, wait, so people... Let's talk about, cause a lot of, there's a lot of people listening, a lot of women who <laughs> have raised kids, been in corporate, whatever, might have a dream like this. And we actually had, she's a hokey too. Uh, she is a baker and a cookie decorator and has like a cookie subscription box and was on Food Network and all these things and did all that after 50. So let's say somebody has this idea. So you, you went to Italy, you learned how to make pasta, but that doesn't get you into Whole Foods. You know, like what? No. Tell us more. <laughs> so I had no business knowledge so I went and I took classes at, um, through the university here, you know, night classes for uh, people who wanted to start their own businesses. So I learned about cash flow and my balance sheets and fixed and uh, fixed goods costs and all of that, things that I need for this business too. But, um, but there I was dealing with perishables and, um, and it's different. It's food is hard. It was a hard business. And so I had to learn a lot. And, um, and then I built out, um, a shop and we, I was selling out of my shop. I got a little truck. I was going in the neighborhoods, like the ice cream person and selling ice cream in little neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was literally called the pasta lady in Atlanta. And then I sold to restaurants as well. And then one day the the vice president of Whole Foods in the Southeast came into my shop and said, "We, I was at such and such a restaurant, Floodway Cafe, and um, I had your pasta, and I wanted to tell the chef how delicious it was. And the server said, ah, the chef doesn't make it. There's a lady over on the other side of town who makes it. And he said, so I wanted to find you because I want this pasta in our stores. This is a true story. Like, for every small food producer, you know, that's like a dream come true. And so I did everything to make sure that they even gave me a $50,000 loan to get, to be able to, um, you know, yeah, to make, be able to make more pasta. And, um, it was a low, very low interest loan. Yeah. Where were you, did you have a co-packer or co, did you go make it somewhere else? You weren't making this in your kitchen, were you? No, no. I had a bricks and mortar place that I built out that had all the inspections and everything. Yeah, no, no. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, we ramped up and we were in all the whole foods in the Southeast and then we did a line of sauces and that was in all the whole foods and all the stores in Florida. What did you call it? It was called Via Elisa, V-I-A. Elisa way, Elisa street, how, you know? So, um, so then 2008 happened and my business crashed and burned because when you're a little small producer, you don't have like a little bucket of cash sitting over here, especially, uh, I mean, I don't like to stereotype us women, but we tend to, uh, um, bootstrap too much. I should have gotten bigger, a bigger loan when I started out. I should have, you know, had more cash on hand when I started out. And this is a mistake that a lot of us often make. We think, um, you know, we, sometimes we lack confidence in what we're doing. And so we're afraid to ask for the kind of money that we really know that we need. Um, I've since gotten over that now. <laughs> now I and Shark that. Tank wasn't as popular back then no, where, no. you know, you yes. watch Shark Tank and Mark Cuban's like, you need more money. Right. This is not going to work. So. That's right. And, and so, yeah, the financial crisis happened in 2008 Mm -hmm. and, and the rest, you know, people weren't eating out as much, just, you know, I'd had all this, you know, exponential growth. And then we, there was a retraction and that I hadn't planned for, but at the end, like they would come in, we didn't have money to pay the electric bill. They shut Mm -hmm. off the electricity. I had special pliers. I go outside and I cut the wire and we'd start up again. (laughs) Were you so sad though? I mean, that's, it sounds like that was your baby. Like that was yours and, and businesses fail. It happens and it's it's not fun. No, it's not fun. 
it was miserable. I had to lay off like five employees. Um, oh. They were full time. And I, but I have to say that that was my first kind of foray into what it means to be part of a community. So like I was part of, um, as an adult, so I was part of the food community in Atlanta. I was part of the communities that I would bring the pasta to. I was, it was really wonderful to have this sense of community here. Um, and so, and, and now I have, um, I mean, I lost all of our money. <laughs> I lost everything. I lost every dime that I got in my, uh, yeah, in my buyout at CNN, which was 18 months full pay, full benefit. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, for but a while so it was important. doing okay, but, <laughs> then but, it, but then at the end it wasn't. But yeah. you're okay. And we're going to talk about how you yeah, shifted no, and where sure. you are now, but it's important for people to hear that. I, I went through a similar thing. I invented a product and it was in 2010. There weren't 3D printers and nobody in the US wanted to help me. So I had to manufacture in China and I had to do an entire pallet and we mortgaged the house. Same kind of thing. Like It's like, oh my God, we're going to lose everything if I don't figure something out quickly. And it it's a paralyzing feeling. I mean, I, there were a lot of sleepless nights and crying nights and it's, you know, it, it takes a lot to start a business and grow it. And sometimes it yeah. works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, okay. So, so we, we said goodbye to that yeah. and, but you have a wonderful next chapter. So let's talk about how you, I'm guessing you went in, started working with your husband, but Right. I so don't know for sure. <laughs> yes, I did. So when I closed the pasta shop, I just was, you know, I kept saying, I never want to work in perishables again. I never want to have bricks and mortar again. I never, you know, but I also developed a really soft spot in my heart for anyone who has their own business and especially a food business. Because like we would have um, electrical storm, we would have a thunderstorm and I lose my electricity and suddenly I come running around Atlanta trying to find dry ice or gen. I mean, it was just, it's never ending because people are putting that in their bodies. Like it has to be perfect. Right. So, so we closed and my husband had his production company, but he was working with different directors and different producers. And he, we had always worked together. We met at CNN. We met in Somalia during that, um, during the U S intervention there. And then we dated. Well, and, and, and somebody yeah. told me I should ask you about this, how, where you actually met like mm. on a roof with, can you tell that story? Yeah. So we met during the first Gulf war in a Jordan and I'm on Jordan. CNN was set up there and Neil, my husband was living in London and I was living in Rome and CNN would send people from all over. And so we met there and we were just friends. I was dating someone else and he was married. And so we were friends for many years. And then I broke up with my boyfriend and Neil and his wife, um, you know, got divorced. And, um, so then we noticed each other kind of in a different way. So, but we first met in Amman, Jordan, then we started dating in Mogadishu years later. And then where, what else? Yeah. I mean, we got engaged in Bosnia. <laughs> But there was some, uh, we have a mutual friend who said something about like when you met, there were like people were shooting all around you or you were on a roof. Yeah, in some, Somalia. Some we spent a lot of time in Somalia. Yeah. And that's where, mm -hmm. when we started dating, that's where we were. And it was really, I mean, it was civil war. It was pretty, uh, you sure, know, bad, yeah. si difficult situation. Um, you know, we always had the saying, it seemed, well, you know, it's war. So, but it turned out that, you know, we've been together now for 30 years. <laughs> There's a meant to be. There's a meant to be. There's, yeah. So when I had, um, so later on, when I, you know, I left, I closed the pasta shop and I was a little aimless. Um, Neil asked me if I wanted to work with him. And I said, yeah, that would be great, but only if it's my business. And so he said, okay, you can buy it for a dollar. So I bought his business from him for a dollar. And he was very happy because then I would deal with all the things that, aren't really exciting for him. So I deal with everything except he gets to film and edit and that's what he loves doing. So I deal with clients and all the business things and it works. And then he produces with me and I direct. Sometimes he directs, just depends, but he doesn't so have to deal with the administrative stuff, which he doesn't like. And so let's talk about, you've done some, let's talk about wasteland. Mm -hmm. um, you're, and let's talk about, first of all, really what you obviously have a passion for telling a certain kind of story that 
impacts a lot of people. So what, you know, what got you involved in that? Um, I would say that what interests me the most in storytelling is how we live in community with each other. Why, why is community so important? What tears community apart? Is it uh, internal things? Is it outside influences? What does community do for us? How do we embed, you know, racism in our communities, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so I would say community is what really gets me excited. And, um, and so we, we've done quite a few projects, um, since Neil and I joined forces. So one of them was, um, welcome to Pine Lake. It's a feature documentary, which on August 3rd will be on all Delta flights for three months. So if anyone's flying Delta, yeah, they can watch it there. It's, um, it was first released on CBS digital and then um, it's on Paramount plus now. And um, that's a film about a little town outside of Atlanta of um, about 700 people. And I was really inspired to go there and um, share a story of women's empowerment, because at the time when we filmed there, it was the only city in the entire country that was governed entirely by women. So the mayor, the, the entire city council, the judge, the chief of police. I mean, everyone, they're all, they, at that time were all women. And I was really wanted to tell this story um, of this place because I think women, we wake up every morning sometimes, well, most mornings and we look at the you know news and we say, what if women were running this place? Like how different would it be? Um, and so I wanted to kind of show that. And what I found was that even in a place run by, women, uh, there are things that are so embedded in uh, how we govern and how we live that, um, that we, we, have, we have to always be self-examining and, and look at our actions. So in Little Pine Lake, um, they have a police force and they get all of their money from ticketing on one little strip of road. And 90% of the tickets go to people of color for expired tags. And while it's legal, it's kind of, not kind of, it's morally corrupt. They're um, taking money from the surrounding communities to pay for their own security. Um, and so uh, when that, that's also in the film. So it's, it's the Atlanta Journal. Did you kind uncovered of, all of this. No, it was kind of known, but there was a there was a, a lawsuit like 20 years ago or more where they said, well, because 90% of the people that drive down this particular road are people of color there. So it only is normal that those would be the people that get the tickets. And maybe that's the fact and maybe that's the law, but it doesn't change the fact that this predominantly white community is financing its police force on the backs of the surrounding community. So this is a little community, which is predominantly white, surrounded by predominantly black neighborhoods, um, because it was, it's just been like that forever. And um, so when white flight happened, these, the, this group, this little city, they kind of stayed. Um, so people were not happy with me when that was also part of the film. But I felt like uh, we all need need to self examine. It was painful for me. I didn't want. I wanted it to be a super inspiring film, but I realized that um, everyone's dealing with similar challenges, or should be uh, working towards uh, getting rid of those kinds of practices, even if they're legal. I mean, we all know that n not all laws are also moral, and just because this law is on the books and allows for it, it doesn't mean that it's okay. And so I had a real problem with the leadership there not doing something about it. <laughs> Almost like your the the war stories that you had yeah. there going into a you know small town in the USA. Sounds like it could be very similar. Yeah, it was it was tough. Um it, because I I did go in with a very positive attitude, but you see things and you can't not see them. And so when you go into the courtroom of Pine Lake, it's in a predominantly white um, city, but the courtroom, all of the, def I never saw a white defendant the whole time I was in there. Wow. Well, I can't wait to watch this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to find it. <laughs> Good. All right. Let's talk about Wasteland. Right. So Wasteland um, was a four-part docu-series. So after we did Pine Welcome to Pine Lake, 
um, CBS purchased that, CBS Digital purchased that. And then they came to us and they asked us if we might be interested in doing um, a docu-series, so a four-part four series on waste in America, meaning human waste, so our sewage, right? How how do we live um, and uh, when there are problems with um, disposal of our sewage? So we went to four communities, one Mount Vernon, New York, um, is a city there who they were having terrible flooding. Um, they had antiquated, um, sewage infrastructure. So every time it rained, sewage would mix with runoff and back in, up into people's homes. Um, this was going on citywide. And then we went to Alabama in the black belt where, um, the soil there does not allow for good, um, drainage of septic systems. And most people live in rural homes where they're not on municipal systems. And so a lot of people were living with cesspools in their backyards because the septic system would break down and then they would straight pipe the sewage out of their homes into a ditch in the backyard. Um, and then, I mean, which is highly dehumanizing. I can't imagine having to live day to day in, you know, your own waste. It's horrific. And then in Florida, where they have a problem again with septic tanks and putting them in, um, in areas where the water level is too high. So the septic tank is sitting in water already, which means it can't drain properly, which means there's a lot of nitrates in the rivers and um, they get big algae blooms. And then the last one was pig waste in Iowa. So we looked at how um, these industrial, um, you know, CAFOs, um, these buildings with a lot of hogs in them, uh, the industrial farmers, they use that waste and spray it on the crops but what happens is it's oversprayed and then it runs off into the water and into the river and then it needs to be cleaned. And so Iowans pay some of the highest uh, fresh, you know, water um, bills in the country because they have to clean, you know, those has to be cleaned. And it's a very um, technologically advanced water treatment plant they have in Des Moines to have to deal with all that. So those were the four stories. Now, the one in Mount Vernon, the leadership in Mount Vernon had been asking for oh, 20 years for federal and state money to repair their sewage system because they just didn't have the money to do it. And after the governor saw this documentary, it was a half an hour, she approved a $150 million grant to fix the sewage system in Mount Vernon. And, and how so good does that make you now. feel that well, you no. could tell a story and, yeah. and help? I mean, how many people does that help? That's amazing. Um, the thing is, is that as a documentarian, you make, uh, you know, we'll make a film and put it out in the world. And you never know. Does it have impact? Does, did anyone watch that? Did anyone care? Did anyone take action? Um, and with this, like the governor said, she said to the mayor, after I, after watching that, I had to do something. Seeing is believing. And so we know that the film was one of the reasons behind taking action. Um, in Mount, in Alabama, there's a nonprofit that um, they install um, engineered septic systems that can work in the soil there, which is red clay. And um, they got huge donations after that. Um, so, so, you know, Florida, nothing happened. I think the, you know, the developers are still putting in septic tanks where they shouldn't. And in Iowa, uh, there are more CAFOs than ever before, which are the confined animal feeding operations. So yeah, to, but you, you made, you made a difference <laughs> in two places. Yeah, I mean, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's there. You don't know what will happen. You know, it's put out there. So the next governor might see that and say, okay, now we have to make a change. Yes. Yeah. Mount Vernon had, um, what happened there was the um, the sewage was above the runoff. And so uh, over 150 years, the sewage pipes started crumbling into the drain off pipes. And so there was sewage going into the Bronx and the Hutchison rivers. And so the city was being fined thousands of dollars a day because of this problem. But if you keep fining them, where's the money ever gonna come from to fix it? It was so punitive, um, but then they got this grant, so. Yay, Yay. that's great. <laughs> And then your latest project, I want to talk about that, the um, young boy in the Philippines. Yes. So we went to the Philippines to uh, September in 2022 um, to uh, work. We filmed for 25 days with a young boy with 
um, he's cleft affected. And um, so in, in, it's called facial differences. This was a term that I had to learn that for various reasons, people have uh, facial differences, cleft, scarring, all, there can be any number of things, right? And so um, Jari has a facial difference and we went there um, to film with him. And we, well, we didn't go to film with him. We went to film um, the healthcare workers who were coming together to make sure he got the care that he needed. But once we got there, the healthcare workers weren't that interested in us going home with them and filming them in the way that we needed to. But in the process, we met Jari. And so we went, uh, we met his sister, who, who's his caregiver and guardian. And she said, yeah, you can come film with us. I said, you know, I had to, it was very important to me and to her that she understood exactly what she was getting herself into. And, you know, that she, she understand all of this, she understood all that and she was fine with it. So we spent close to three weeks with him as he got his surgery and came home and started getting better. And really what I wanted to show was that it's not a magical fix. Like, so I think a lot of times in global health, we have this idea that, um, you know, this one thing's going to be a fix. So, um, and it, it's never is Jari has, was bullied He's th he was 13 years old at the time. He was bullied his entire life for this. Um, he suffered real trauma. He's going to need, you know, therapy, all kinds of things, even if his, even if his cleft has been repaired. And so I really wanted to tell a story that was more real also to his experience also because he's not a kid with cleft. He's a kid who has a facial difference and he has, and he's a teenager in all the ways that you know, teenagers are teenagers. And um, I just wanted people to see him and the family as a full story. But what happened was we realized that the sister had made a lot of sacri sacrifices to make sure that Jari could live with her and get the care that he needed. So at the end of the day, she's really the person that we're focusing on, like how one person can really make a difference um, in another person's life. What a rewarding career you've had. Like you, I feel like you, you go into these stories in one direction and then it shifts and, you know, you're able just to tell incredible stories, which is your talent to, to find that and to be able to do that. Um, wow. Well, I can't, I cannot wait to watch all of them. And, um, I, I wrap up every episode. I hate to end it because there's so many more things I'd like to talk to you about, but, um, what is the greatest thing that you have accomplished since you turned 50? Um, I, I would say my greatest accomplishment, um, career wise was the, um, the grant to the city of Mount Vernon. It's a really wonderful feeling to like think that I had a small part in that and that people that I met there, their homes won't be flooding with sewage anymore. Um, yeah, that I think as far as my career, that's my biggest thing that I'm, I'm most pleased about. Um, but my, I, I'm 61. And when I look, if I had to choose a decade that I would relive again, it would definitely be my fifties. I know someone in their twenties is probably like, what's she talking about? <laughs> but I just feel, um, so much more, uh, confident. I feel like I can pull on a lot of experiences, um, and make a lot of connections across those experiences. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I'm 61 there. Sometimes I forget stuff. Sometimes like the sponge is full, right. But it's full of really good stuff. <laughs> so that's okay. Somebody told me in, in one of my recent interviews that studies have shown that, that women are happiest and most fulfilled in their sixties then I'm excited because I've got, you know, nine more years yeah. <laughs> of that. <laughs> and that leads me to my next question. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? In 10 years, I hope to be living back in Italy. It, you know, I hope to be um, still doing what I do. I love what I do. I, it's, you know, so just, but maybe doing more projects that I generate and less that I'm doing because some it's someone else's project. Because I get hired sometimes to direct projects, but it's not really something that I generated. So, and I'd love to be doing more work in global health. 
Oh, well, thank and I hope you. I see my kids a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> do, you, do you have grandkids yet? No, no. I have two daughters they are 25 and 26, but they live in Montana. So I'm hoping they'll come to visit me a lot. But. Oh, that's where our kids are about the same age. I've got 24 and 26. So, um, well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. And we're going to put all of um, your episodes, all the docuseries, everything in the show notes so people can go and watch them. Thank um, you. Thank you for listening or for watching this episode of Living Ageless and Bold. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit subscribe. And if you like the episode, I hope that you will give us a great review. You can also head over to livingagelessandbold.com and sign up for information, inspiration, and exclusive opportunities for us, women over 55. Thanks for listening. And remember, no matter what you do, keep living ageless and bold.